chapter of this session, uh, although uh, it's not the end of the day by any means. Uh, so the last speaker of this session is Zohar Komar Godsky from Stony Brook University. And Zohar will be talking about line defects and RG flows. So Zohar, are you there? Uh, we don't hear you yet. Um, you, Zohar, you're still muted. Audio is muted. Yes. Hi, everybody. Now you're unmuted. Very good. Hello, everybody. Thanks yeah, so much. Hello. Welcome. Great to have you here. Please start. Thanks so much for this opportunity to talk. Uh, and I also managed to catch a few of the previous talks, which was very nice. Uh, my talk will be about uh, line operators or line defects, renormalization group flows and magnets. Um, this is based on several papers. One already appeared in the end of the summer. One will appear probably tomorrow or the day after. And then there is some uh, work in progress that I will, I will only barely mention. Uh, I was told that I can be interrupted with questions during the talk or at the end. Um, either way, it's fine with me. So please interrupt me if there are any questions. So the subject of line operators or line defects in a quantum many body systems or, quant or quantum field theory has been, a, of course, historically very productive and influential. Wilson came up with the renormalization group um, after having learned about the condo problem. So that's what motivated Wilson to develop the RG. In fact, there was a substantial progress on in integrability thanks to the condo problem again. And of course, the conformal, the idea that there is conformal symmetry at long distances for many, for many, many body systems uh, came also from the study of various line defects in condensed matter physics. So the aim of this talk is to explore line defects in higher dimensions, which is a subject that is substantially uh, less explored. So let me define the setup. The setup is that there will be some conformal field theory in D dimensions uh, in the bulk, D space-time dimensions, I should say, in the bulk. And then there will be some one-dimensional defect uh, placed uh, on a straight line or on a circle in some parts of the talk. <clears throat> So we are familiar with many line operators or line defects in um, conformal field theories in D dimensions. For instance, uh, there are in gauge theories, we have the wilson toft loops. Um, in various uh, conformal field theories with symmetries, there are so-called twist defects. There is something that condensed matter people call SPT defects, which I will not talk about today. And even when the bulk is just a topological field theory, there are line operators, which are the word lines of anions in the topological field theory. So there are many constructions of line defects. And um, uh, I'll try to say some things which are general about line defects in more than two dimensions. There will be two subjects in this talk. One will be that I'll make some very general comments about renormalization group flows on line defects. And then I'll talk about a very concrete example that will appear in the archive this week. Uh, which is some line operator in the ON model that we've studied in the recent couple of months with uh, collaborators, whose names I uh, may, didn't say, uh, but Gabriel Cuomo, Mark Mazze, and Avia Raviv Moshe. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> so when we have a straight line in a d dimensional conformal field theory, the line can or may or may not preserve the the maximal possible conformal symmetry. So if the line defect is conformal, it would preserve SL2R times SOD minus one. SL2R is a conformal symmetry that's associated to the quantum mechanics on the line in quotation marks being conformally invariant. And SOD minus one is just the transverse rotation symmetry. Now it is in, it is in principle probably possible that there would be conformal line defects which carry transverse spin. But to my knowledge, those were never constructed uh, up to now, at least in non-trivial conform non bulk conformal filters, this was not constructed as far as I know. So I'll just talk about line defects, which are conformal and uh, preserve the transverse rotation group. 
Um, well, I'll talk about RG flows, but if these line defects are conformal, then they, they preserve this full symmetry. Now, in condensed matter uh, literature, this uh, setup where there is a conformal filter with a line defect is very interesting because it describes an impurity. And an impurity is like, an, you can think about it as a lattice system with some external atom or some external background field that's localized at the point in space. And there is some RG flow associated to such impurities. And if these impurities are conformal, then they preserve this full symmetry. Okay, so that's the setup. So let me tell you about an interesting but rather abstract observable for line defects. This is something that we call the defect entropy. Okay. The, however, it's not the same as the entanglement entropy of this impurity. You can define an entanglement entropy for such an impurity, which is conformal or non-conformal. Uh, but what I'm calling defect entropy is not the same. So the idea is you just make the line into a circle, which makes sense in Euclidean signature, and you compute the expectation value of the circle. And the expectation value of the circle is called log L. But then this expectation value of the circle is slightly scheme dependent because there is a cosmological constant term that you can add to log L. Uh, this is just because you can assign whatever mass, uh, you, can, you can just say that your impurity has some arbitrary mass and that would introduce some uh, linear term in R inside the expectation value of the circle. So to define a purely, you know, an intrinsic defect entropy that doesn't depend on scheme, you act with this operator, which removes the linear piece, and you call this the defect entropy. At fixed points of the renormalization group on the line, the defect entropy is also sometimes called log G. Okay, so this is a scheme independent intrinsic observable, which you can think about as the defect entropy log G. For topological field theories, G is also called the quantum dimension. And it satisfies this inequality. The G is always bigger than one, bigger or equal to one. However, as I'll show you very soon, when the ambient space equals a conformal field theory, the defect entropy does not have to be bigger than one. I'll show you examples where it's arbitrarily small and close to zero. I have now, a question. Yes, thank you for interrupting. I was about to stop for a second for questions. Yes. So when you say that uh, the defect is a circle, isn't the conformal symmetry lifted to the Virasoro symmetry? All right. From a cell so to here, okay. Here the setup is that the bulk, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. It's too early. Here the setup is that the bulk is a conformal filter in D dimensions. When you have a straight line, which is conformal, then you preserve this symmetry. You agree with that? Yeah. Now a circle and a straight line, are almost the same. You can go from each to the other by some sort of conformal transformation that doesn't vanish at infinity. It's like an inversion. So actually a circle and a straight line preserve the exact same symmetries. It's some kind of auto external outer automorphism of SL to R times SOD minus one. So it's basically the same. The circle and the straight line preserve the same because the bulk is always d-dimensional. So there is never a Virasoro for d equal bigger than two. For d equals two, you're completely right that uh, both the straight line and the circle preserve the full Virasoro. But I'm not talking about okay. d equals two. Any other questions? So you wrote down g is greater than one. So g equals to one is uh, is that the empty defect or what is what is that? All right, in topological field theories, a lot is known about it. Okay, for topological field theories. Uh, so for topological filters, G equals to one does not imply that it is a, that it is a, the trivial line. G equals to one implies that it's what's called an abelian anion in condensed matter language. So you're right, G equals one could have, so G equals one includes the trivial line, but there are also uh, anions which are abelian, which also have G equals one, okay? However, any, every anion in, top, in the topological filter setting must satisfy this. Now, when the bulk is a conformal filter in D dimensions, uh, G equals one does not imply that it's a trivial line either. And in fact, G can also be much smaller than one, as you'll see in some examples below. 
Okay. Yeah, thank you. Now, another piece of setup, I'm just setting up for some terminology. There is something that's called defect operators. What are defect operators? The concept is very simple. These are operators that can live on the line. Then there are local operators that can live in the bulk. And you can ask, what is the relationship between operators that live in the bulk and operators that live on the line? So one trivial comment is that if the line is trivial, if the line defect is just trivial, there is no impurity, then of course the operators that you can put on the line coincide with the bulk operators. You just decompose them under this smaller symmetry group. However, in, for general line defects, there is absolutely no relationship between bulk operators and line operators. And uh, in the context of the bootstrap, there is an expansion. So you can try to bring a bulk operator close to the line and expand it in a power series, which includes defect operators. So in this talk, hat, when I put a hat on a local operator, it always means that this local operator lives on the line. So in general, there is a bulk defect OP and uh, this family of operators and their scaling dimensions uh, are unrelated to the bulk data a priori. Now, if your line operator has a defect operator, which has dimension smaller than one, you can trigger an RG flow by just integrating this operator on the line. So this, so you could start from a conformal line operator, but if your conformal line operator is not infrared stable, namely it has an operator of dimension smaller than one, you can trigger an RG flow. And you can ask how would the expectation value of the circular line depend on the radius? So for conformal line defects, obviously the radius doesn't matter because there is no scale. But as soon as you have a deformation like that, then there is some non-trivial dependence on the radius for the defect entropy. And uh, there is an RG flow from some ultraviolet line defect to some infrared line defect. So when the radius is very small, you get the log of the G of the ultraviolet line defect. And when the radius is very big, you get log G of the infrared line defect. So there's some renormalization group flow on the line. I'll show you some examples soon. So one main result that appeared a few months ago on the archive that I already mentioned is a general formula for how this defect entropy changes as you change the radius of the loop. So changing the radius of the loop or changing the mass scale with which you integrate is the same thing because the defect entropy depends only on the product of these two quantities. So here I just chose to write it in this way. So the gradient of the defect entropy as you change the mass scale is given by an integral, a double integral on the loop with insertions of the energy density on the loop. So TD is just the energy density on the line defect or at the impurity. Uh, this can be defined unambiguously. And since this is a connected two point function, it's non-negative and it's actually modulated by this funny factor that we found and this funny factor is also non-negative. So one establishes that, in fact, as you change the radius, the defect entropy must decrease monotonically. And in particular, it implies a G theorem for line defects in higher dimensions. I'll make some comments and then stop for questions. Comment number one is that you might know that there is already a G theorem for, two -dimensional, for line defects in two-dimensional conformal field theories. So this is a generalization to any number of dimensions. And it's not just a generalization of that. We also have a particular gradient formula um, that holds in every number of dimensions. It follows that G must be independent of exactly marginal defect couplings. It could be that some defects have exactly marginal operators, namely operators whose dimension is exactly one. And you can furthermore deform the defect by these operators without changing the dimension of O hat. So in such, G cannot depend on that because if it did, you would contradict this inequality. <coughs> we will, I'll show you an example of that. And <clears throat> I wanna make a comment about entanglement entropy. I think that this uh, G theorem a little bit conf is confusing from the point of view of the connection between monotonicity theorems and entanglement entropy because this G function or the defect entropy that I defined has nothing to do with the entanglement entropy of the impurity. In two dimensions, when the bulk is two dimensional, Cassini, uh, Salazar, Landea, and Toroba 
show that you can understand the old Affleck Ludwig G theorem using information theory. But that's because the G theorem in two dimensions is the same as the entanglement entropy of the impurity. However, this relationship doesn't hold in D bigger than two. So that's a little bit unfortunate. And uh, one has to understand how to connect what I'm saying to entanglement entropy. Are there any questions? Hello, Zohar. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, one question. So maybe you said that and I missed uh, on the previous slide when you define the two point function of T, uh, it's, a, it's a defect operator, right? This T, ED. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have put a hat. It's my bad. It's a defect operator. No, indeed. no, it's fine. And uh, it is calculated at a conformal. What is the subscript C? Connected. Connected. I see. So this is not necessarily evaluated at the fixed point, right? This is just a, at any point along the RG flow. You're a hundred percent correct. Okay. Thank you. If there are I any have, other questions. I have a, I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, going back to my previous question, uh, the diffeomorphism symmetry of the circle is the Virasoro group, right? Yes. So does that have any bearing to what you're trying to say? No, usually the filters on the circle break the symmetry completely. You're right that the geometrically the circle has a, a large, I mean, the you can make diffeomorphisms of the circle, but uh, usually when we put a quantum system on, uh, on the circles or in the bulk, then those symmetries are broken. And the only symmetries that are unbroken, if the circle happens to be conformal, is SL2R times SOD minus one. The, okay. And if there is a renormalization group flow, then even this symmetry is broken down to translations on the circle and transverse rotations. Okay. So it depends on this. It, yeah, these geometric symmetries are always or almost always reduced to something by the physics of these uh, geometric objects. Yeah. Okay, I'll continue. I'll just tell you in one, in two slides, what is the idea of how this uh, a little bit mysterious formula is proven. I'll just give you the idea. I don't have time to explain. So the first step that you make is that you generalize the idea of a renormalization group flow to allow for a time-dependent renormalization group flow. So that means that the mass that you, so you integrate some operator, which is relevant. And I again, forgot I had, I apologize for that. So you integrate some operator on the defect, but now you're allowed to do that in a time dependent fashion. And phi t is just a background classical field. It's not a quantum field. It's just something that modulates the mass term along the circle or along the infinite line. <clears throat> so this is what people usually call the dilaton in the renormalization group flow literature. This allows you to define a larger class of possible perturbations, so it's useful. And the next step is that you, the bulk theory, being that it's a conformal field theory, has conformal symmetries. So it has topological surfaces. So what you do is you bring the topological surface from the bulk, you wrap the circle, and because this surface in the bulk is topological, by wrapping the circle, you create a new circle. Basically, you fuse the topological surface with the line defect, and you create a new line defect. And this is the computation that you need to do. You need to compute which line defect you create by fusing the bulk surface with the line defect. OK? Uh, and so this, takes, this gives a bunch of identities, in fact, infinitely many identities, for how you can change this phi of t to various other phases of t's without actually changing the physics. And so this leads to infinitely many new identities. And if you try to understand all these identities systematically, the first non-trivial identity that you find is this. This is the first non-trivial identity. That's what we've shown in the paper. We did not look at the other identities. But uh, OK, that's what you get. Now I'll show you some examples of how it works. What is the simplest line operator in all of quantum field theory, other than the trivial line operator? It's just you take a free scalar field in any number of dimensions. Phi is a free scalar field, what they call mean field theory. In any number of dimensions, you integrate it on a line. You put some coefficient, which you call zeta. And that's your line operator. 
That's the simplest line operator you can imagine. If you want to think about it as a renormalization group flow, then zeta equals, well, let's say that we're below four dimensions so that this, inter, that this operator has dimension smaller than one and that this drives an RG flow from zeta equals zero, which is the trivial line defect. And it drives it to some, uh, some, something in the infrared that we have to determine. Okay, so that's the setup. It's an RG flow from a trivial line defect, just completely empty transparent line to some possible non-trivial infrared line defect. So you can actually solve it completely because it's everything is free. This is the action. So you have a D in D dimensions a free scalar field, then you integrate on the defect phi. Uh, this is a classical field theory because, well, sorry. Uh, this is a quadratic field theory, not classical. It's a quadratic field theory. Uh, the one loop determinants are important for some questions. Uh, so, however, it's very easy to solve, obviously, being that it's quadratic, and this is the defect entropy. So this is just a bunch of factors that depend on the number of dimensions you can ignore. This is the radius dependence. You see, this is the radius dependence, and this is the dependence on the coupling zeta. The most important thing is to observe that this prefactor is negative. So you can show it by just putting, plotting it in Mathematica. You can see that it's negative for all dimensions, smaller than four and bigger than two. And what the system describes is an RG flow from the trivial line defect. When the circle is very small, the defect entropy is zero, as appropriate to the fact that in the ultraviolet, we have a trivial line defect. But in this system, there is a disease the disease is that when we make the loop very large, the defect entropy just goes to minus infinity, or in other words, G goes to zero in any number of dimensions smaller than four. So this is probably a disease that has to do with the fact that the bulk conformal field theory has a modulate space of Bakwa. And I don't, personally, I don't expect that this is possible in theories which have a healthy single conformal vacuum. But anyway, in this theory, uh, it just the defect entropy just flows to minus infinity at the infrared. In other words, this impurity is a little bit sick. You can think about this impurity experimentally as putting external magnetic field for uh, an external magnetic field in some spin chain. And this means that effectively the magnetic field becomes infinite uh, when you go to long distances. So it just polarizes the whole. So physically what it means is that um, a localized magnetic field would just polarize the whole chain or the whole action. lattice. Yes. Is the action bounded from below? Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, it is bounded from below in the bulk. This is only localized on a circle. The defect is a circle. So, then, so let's, shift the, let's shift the zero mode of phi everywhere in space time. Oh yes, that's the modular space of vacuum indeed. Uh, sorry, I did no, not. No, it's not a modular space because you have an action. The term in the defect makes it smaller and smaller. So the action, you don't have a modular space. In fact, it's not bounded from below. Yeah, you're right. I did not answer the question correctly. That's, yeah, what you said is another way of saying of why I think that this is due to the, that, that there is a modular space of vacuum in the bulk before we've put the defect. That's, yeah. So that's why I believe yeah, as a conjecture. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. You're, you're, Path integral is not well defined. Yes, I agree. I agree with that. This model is uh, sick. Um, as a conjecture, I do believe that in theories with a healthy, unique vacuum in which is conformal in the bulk, uh, this can never happen, but I don't know how to prove that. Now in four dimensions, even though the same objection that Nari just raised still exists, actually in four dimensions, the defect entropy does not flow this goes away and this whole factor becomes zero because this gamma function is gamma of zero and that's infinite. So the defect entropy just stays zero. And this is saying that this is an exactly marginal parameter in four dimensions. So this line operator also has an exactly marginal. Hmm? Uh, the, this, this defect term can be written as a source, source term, right? Phi times some J integrated over the entire space with some delta functions thrown in, right? Yeah, that's what I did here. That's what it's written here. Yeah, so it can be written as a source as a source term. I mean, some source j times phi. That, so that's what I did here. 
yeah so if you integrate out the phi it would be simply a function in terms of the i mean it would just be e to the minus j delta j where delta is the green's function right yes this is just free filter it's very easy to solve you can solve it by, yeah, like so, you can solve it by so I, either integrating out phi or you can solve it by integrating out the bulk and getting a non local theory on the defect it all leads to this yeah. answer yeah so i i don't see why it leads to any pathologies we can discuss it later. I just have seven minutes and I have a huge amount of stuff that I wanted to tell you. But uh, it's, in, it's uh, amusing that in four dimensions, it is actually exactly marginal. Uh, the G function doesn't depend on zeta, but other observables do, such as the one point function of the energy momentum tensor. I just wanted to the tell you something. still not bounded from below. Yes, even you're in four right. Dimensions. Right, but uh, everything makes sense, it seems. But you're right. Now I'll study a healthier system, uh, which is also experimentally much more interesting. And as far as I know, people already started trying to reproduce what I'm gonna tell you experimentally. So this idea of just studying RG flows that begin at the trivial defect is obviously generalizable. Every time you have a bulk CFT with an operator of dimension smaller than one, you can integrate it on some dimension one line. Uh, and the simplest example that comes to mind is the ON model. Okay, so in the ON model, we have a vector phi, which is called the order parameter, and phi one is the first component of the vector phi. You take phi one, you integrate it, and that's it. This leads to a renormalization group flow from the trivial defect all the way down to uh, some non trivial conformal def defect conformal filtering. Um, I forgot to say that in this example, you can also check this identity with a two point function. It will be important for some things very, very soon. So from the G theorem, it follows that this must flow to a non-trivial defect conformal filter because G is one in the ultraviolet being that it's a trivial line defect and uh, G must decrease and therefore it cannot be a trivial defect. So just by the G theorem, it follows that this must result in some non-trivial defect conformal filtering. And in fact, this problem makes sense even in two dimensions, but just for n equals one, where it's the Ising model. So it's some particular uh, interface in the Ising model. So this is physically realizable just by putting some localized magnetic field in a quantum critical point. It's pretty easy to realize in Monte Carlo and also with quantum Hamiltonians using these quantum simulators that uh, people have written about recently. And also it's probably something that can be analyzed with the bootstrap, this particular de defect conformal filter. I'm gonna tell you a few things about it in the remaining five minutes. Uh, this external magnetic field breaks the symmetry from ON to ON and minus one. And also the translation symmetry is broken by the existence of a non-trivial defect in the infrared. Um, and so this leads to some protected operators on the defect, which are called the displacement and tilt operators. I'm gonna ignore them uh, just to, because, well, I'll tell you about the non-trivial facts about this defect. So this is the line operator. And I have three quick comments to make about it, other than that it has to flow to a non-trivial defect in the infrared. Comment number one is that in the two dimensional case where N is equal to one, it's very easy to guess what's the endpoint of this RG flow. It's some like conformal line defect in the Ising model and they've been classified. And there is one that is completely stable for infrared perturbations. It has G equals a half. And actually the operator phi one undergoes huge renormalization. Um, it starts in the UV as the phi one operator, as the spin operator of the Ising model, which has dimension one over eight, but it ends up being uh, one of the operators in this particular interface, which is uh, composed of two of the fusion of two Cardi states and it has dimension two. So it undergoes pretty big renormalization. That's comment number one. Comment number two, which I'm going to um, just mentioned quickly, is that actually this line operator can be studied in the epsilon expansion. And that's not obvious. So the bulk coupling is very small in the epsilon expansion. That's well known from Wilson and Fisher. But the defect coupling, the, this coupling also undergoes an RG flow from H equals zero to something in the infrared. The defect coupling is actually not small parametrically at the fixed point. Yet an epsilon expansion can be obtained and you can make lots of predictions in the epsilon expansion. The reason that you can do the epsilon expansion, even though the, the defect 
running is sort of large is because the dependence on H is polynomial to every order in Lambda. So the fact that there is a small coupling in the bulk is sufficient to have complete control over the system. But this is just a sketch of a few observables. So this is the logarithm of the G function of the defect in the epsilon expansion. This is the dimension of the lowest operator, which is ON minus one singlet. That's the same operator that in the Ising model undergoes large renormalization. So uh, I'm just, uh, uh, for the record, putting some uh, concrete results here. You see that this is uh, bigger than one, so it becomes irrelevant in the infrared as you would expect. And this is the one point function of some bulk operator. So in the bulk, phi one measures the magnetization and it decays away from the defect. And that's the coefficient with which it decays up to the obvious scaling. So that's the non-trivial uh, bulk to, this is what I call the A coefficient in the bulk to defect OP uh, at, in some slide in the past here. This is this coefficient. Okay, so you can do the epsilon expansion. You can obtain a lot of predictions and even extrapolate to three dimensions where this is experimentally realizable. What you find is that you expect, roughly speaking, a rather weak end dependence and that the dimension of the first non-trivial ON singlet operator, ON minus one singlet operator is gonna be 1.5. So that's roughly speaking the prediction. The last thing I wanna tell you about is what happens in the large end limit. This is probably the most interesting part of the story, but I have only two minutes. So I'll just tell you the idea. So it turns out that this has a smooth large end limit, but you must define a tooth coupling very much like we do in other large end limits. And in this, normalization of the defect coupling, the tooth coupling is actually order one in the infrared. And what we argue is that there is a new classical action, like a master field action that governs this defect conformal field theory at long distances. So what is the idea? The idea is that at long distances, this defect becomes conformal. So you can map the problem by a wild transformation to ADS two times SD minus two where the ADS arises from essentially some plane that's uh, transverse to the defect. And there is, you do some kind, you do some transformation to ADS two times SD minus two, you do a Hubbard Srotanovich transformation, and you try to find a self-consistent conformal solution for this defect in the large end limit, which is described by some classical action. So after a lot of work, we found this kind of Schwinger Dyson type action uh, and it's a classical field theory with H bar, which is one over N. So it's, well, it's a quantum field theory with a very small H bar. Uh, and our claim is that the critical points of this action and fluctuations about this action compute the properties of the defect conformal field theory at long distances with this external magnetic field. This is the boundary to boundary propagator in ADS2 times SD minus two. This is just the curvature, this is the Laplacian, and this is some field. This is the, the master field, essentially, that you have to vary and compute the fluctuations of. So this is the main part of the problem at large n. And well, uh, we've used a lot of recent progress on ADS loop diagrams, especially from this paper. And this is the bottom line. I'm just sketching a few of the results. This is an exact result in the planar limit for the G function. You see that it's exponentially small. So that shows that G doesn't have to be bigger than one in defect conformal field theory. There is a minus sign and there is an N. So it's really exponentially small. This is the dimension of the field phi one. And as I said, it's pretty close to 1.5 with seems like rather weak N dependence. And this is the one point function of find the bulk. And we have lots of other quantities that we computed in the large N limit by solving the Schrodinger Dyson system by looking for a self-consistent conformal solution to the Schrodinger Dyson system. And now I'm just gonna summarize quickly. Obviously it would be interesting to understand if, some, if there are some lower bounds on G, maybe along these papers. There is something that's called the VEF flows. So in quantum filter, you can have flows with operators or you can have flows by activating some uh, vacuum expectation values for gauge invariant local operators like we have a Coulomb branch in N equals four. People claim that this might happen even for line defects, though I don't understand that. Obviously one can try to contrast these results with experiments. Um, and well, there are some comments here that one should definitely apply the conformal bootstrap for this problem and that's it. 
Thank you so much. Sorry for going over time. Thank you, Zohar, for that beautiful talk. I see a hand raised from the TIFR node. I think it's Abhijit. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, yes. hi, hi Zohar. Thanks, thanks uh, very much for a wonderful talk. So uh, in the talk, when you derived this uh, flow condition for the G, the monotonicity condition, you use some sort of a topological operator. Could you say a little bit more about that? Like yes. What exactly was that operator? Uh, am I like with time wise, am I rushing or can I make an effort to explain? Well, we are going into the Not discussion sure. session now, so I think it's okay. Okay, I'll tell you. Okay, so I can maybe say more than one, more than a few words. Okay. Um, so the bulk doesn't have many topological surfaces. The bulk has topological surfaces that are given by choosing a conformal killing vector, essentially, right? You can integrate T mu nu contracted with a conformal killing vector and an arbitrary co-dimension one surface, and that's a topological operator. So there is a particular conformal killing vector which uh, fixes the line. Um, uh, so this is a conformal killing vector that uh, is associated to this SL2R times SLD minus one. Mm -hmm. So we pick one of those. There are three such things because SL2R has three generators. So one of them is stupid. It's just translations along the line and it doesn't give anything interesting whatsoever. And then there is one that's non-trivial. So we pick one of those that's non-trivial. This is part we of the SL2R. Yes, we okay. integrate it on the surface. And then we ask what happens when we fuse the surface with the line. Now, this is a computation that you have to do. And it's a very subtle computation. But this is the main claim that we, we claim that we did this computation. And what is, so obviously if you fuse it, you get some new line defect just by the axioms of locality. On the other hand, if you blow up the surface, you get zero because it acts on the conformal vacuum. So you get an identity. Mm -hmm. The identity is that whatever line defect you get after the fusion should be the same as the line defect that you originally started from. I see. But when you do this computation, you find that it generates the non-trivial transformation of phi. Basically, it shifts phi by a cosine times phi dot. And then you choose some particular phi for your convenience, and you generate a huge amount of identities. Right. So that's the, that's the main thing. OK, thanks. Uh, so maybe uh, my second question is perhaps related to this one then. Uh, does this uh, way of thinking give some insight about uh, state operator map for uh, such defects? Or more generally, how does one think about classification of such defects? Oh, classification is difficult, I guess. Uh, there is a paper by this gentleman. Um, I believe this paper. Zhao van Reis Leander Lauria that claim that free field theory doesn't have non-trivial defect. Free field theory, let's say in three dimensions, mm -hmm. that have non-trivial defects, line defects. That's consistent with what I've been saying because this doesn't flow to an infrared DCFT because of this issue that Nari pointed out, mm -hmm. that the whole thing is not very bounded and it's a little bit sick. I see. So, for instance, for free field theory, people claim that maybe there isn't any non-trivial defect. But for the ON model, classifying them would be probably insurmountable. I see. No, but even conceptually, uh, how would one go about classifying uh, such defects? Well, I mean, for local cool. operators, we have state operator maps, so one could classify uh, them by looking at right, Hilbert it's space and sphere. Uh, there is, it's the same. There is a, there is a bulk uh, defect OPE. And okay. it, there are two channels. You can first expand, you, you can do a two point function in the bulk. You okay. can do, first do an OP in the bulk, expand in the defect, or first expand on the defect, do OP in the defect. I see. It gives an equation. I see. Unlike I see. the bootstrap equation, it's not a, se a semi definite equation. So there is no positivity. Maybe it's more difficult. I see. But, but what I had in mind, I mean, if I have a, a defect, then I could always couple some, uh, some, uh, some, one, one, you know, some, some quantum mechanical system or some higher dimensional system on the defect and flow down to some un to, to get another defect. So it okay. seems that I can all, uh, keep on doing that and get richer and richer. So of course, I didn't talk about Wilson lines, but Wilson lines. So mm. the defects that I talked about here, just for pedagogical purposes, are defects that start their life as trivial defects in the ultraviolet. 
So we start with the empty unit operator defect. We integrate some bulk operator. Yeah. We get the G flow. Yeah, yeah. And this must have G smaller than one by the G theorem. So it has to be a non-trivial DCFT. Of course, you can do something much more general. You can add quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, couple them to the bulk by gauging or by just yeah. direct coupling like Yukawa type coupling, and then trigger our G flows. This is what in condensed matter is called magnetic impurities. That's what appears in the condo problem. Okay. While what I did here is more like an external field impurity. You model that by taking a spin system and putting some external field at some point in space. But you can do what you said, of course, and it seems like it leads to a large zoo of possibilities. Okay. I agree. Yes, but thank you. It may, it may also be discrete. We, we have no idea if it's discrete, continuous. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was asking because it seems like possibilities are endless. However, the bootstrap approach seems to tell me that I am constrained in some way. So that that is the question that, that I was trying in two to dimensions, In two dimensions, uh, the problem is understood for minimal models. So yeah. for the Ising model. So in the Ising model, uh, there are infinitely many conformal defects, but they come in four families. Mm -hmm. And the families have exactly marginal parameters that are basically interpreted by integrating the epsilon operator. So in the Ising in 2D, we know the answer. And that's probably the only case where we do. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, we have now a question from Nati. Please go ahead. Back to the problem which is not bounded from below. Uh, where is the action? What if you replace phi by phi square? Then it is bounded from below and it remains free, so it should be solvable. But it's irrelevant. I see. So if you write phi square, it's irrelevant? Yes, because phi squared has dimension close to two near four. Well, let's say you're in 4D, it's highly relevant. If you're in 3D, okay, in 3D, it's going to be marginal. Don't, in, yeah, in 3D, it's going to be marginal. That means that with one sign, it will be marginally irrelevant. And with the other sign, it's going to flow yeah. to minus infinity. So there you'll have your instability again. No, but that's a different. Is the sign where it flows to minus infinity the sign where the potential is not bounded from below? That would not? be my guess. That would be my guess, Nari. I didn't do that computation. My guess is that if you put phi squared with a positive coefficient, it flows to zero. And if no, you put with phi one squared, coefficient, I don't know your conventions. With the positive coefficients, it's a meaningful question to ask. With the negative, I wouldn't. I would. It's not that it goes to minus infinity. It's not even meaningful. It's yeah, as with bad positive, as the linear one. Yeah, Nari, with a positive coefficient, it goes to zero. I'm sure of that. I see. With a negative coefficient, it goes to minus infinity. Well, with a negative coefficient, it, it doesn't mean anything to ask how it flows because the, the problem is not set up properly. Yeah, I think what physically happens is that phi wants to go negative and the bulk doesn't stop it because there is no potential in yeah. the bulk. So just phi goes to minus yeah. infinity. Well, that's a statement that it's not bounded from below. So the problem is not well posed when it's negative. Yeah, I think with positive coefficient for phi squared, uh, appendix A in the paper that will come out tomorrow will shows indirectly that it goes to zero, that that's the, the right sign of the beta function. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have maybe time for one last question and then we should move into the discussion session. So, Somdat, you had a question? A brief one. Yeah, so... Yeah, so uh, this uh, this defect term can be understood as j times phi. So I, I I get that before integrating out the phi, it is unbounded from below. But if you integrate out the phi, once you integrate out, out the phi, it is in terms of the j's, right? And then that yes. is not unbounded from below. Let me think about what you're saying. Uh, there is an instability, obviously, in that language too. Well, I think, if you integrate, I if think you integrate, J is not generic, right? J is delta function localized. So the yeah, is, J, J will be some funny delta function. There will be some box in the denominator. There yeah. must be a way to see the instability in that way too. I do think about it in that way. J okay. would just be a delta function. Yeah, but, there would but be you have box. But you, no, no, but there will be some boxes in the denominator if you do it. You check it out, you'll see that there yeah. are boxes in the denominator. Yeah, if so you integrate the, out the phi, there will be. Yeah, okay. J will be the delta fun. Yeah. Okay, I think let's thank Zohar for a very nice talk. Uh, oh, thank Daniel you. had a question. Daniel, did you want to ask?
Oh, oh, I just said if you integrate it out, maybe the what you, the effective action you get is not analytic. It's at equal zero. No, it's just that there is a box in the denominator, and the box has a zero mode because mm -hmm. the bulk field is massless. So that will be the issue. Yeah. The one over box will not be properly defined because there is a zero mode in the bulk. Exactly. Exactly. So I think it's gonna be the same thing. Anyway, these problems don't exist for the more experimentally interesting problem of ON, where you do get a completely healthy DCFT. So that's the reason that we looked at the ON model. So would you say that if you integrate out a massless scalar we coupled to a source, the resultant uh, action is uh, unbounded from below? I don't want to make sweeping claims, but uh, in this particular <laughs> example, we just solved it, and you see that it goes to minus infinity. It's not un it's not in doubt. Yeah, I think now let's thank uh, Zohar for a beautiful talk, uh, and um, and uh, let's move on.